My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Nikki Cave, and the leadership quote for today is by Ronald Reagan. The greatest leader is not necessarily the one who does the greatest things. He's the one that gets the people to do the greatest things. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Are you tasked with ordering food for your office? Let me tell you about Easy Cater. With over 100,000 restaurants to choose from nationwide and 24-7 customer support, Easy Cater helps assistants like you and me succeed at work and makes our lives easier. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hey friends, welcome to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows. I'm very excited to be speaking with Nikki Cave today. Nikki is currently the Administrative Services Director for the Boston Consulting Group's Dallas EA team, EA slash AA team. Um, and this is episode 242. You can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 242, leaderassistant.com slash 242. To Nikki, welcome to the show. Great. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. And you're in Texas, is that right? What part of Texas? Yes, I'm in Dallas. Um, I actually live in Saxe, which is kind of like right outside of Dallas. Nice, nice. And are you from that area? Um, basically from high school to uh, now. Yes, so I would say yes. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's jump right in. Then, uh, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, is a super difficult question. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not at work? So I would say spend time with my family for sure. So I have four children, um, 27, 23, 21, and a 12 year old boy. Um, and I've been married for almost 30 years, uh, and we have uh, two dogs and two grand dogs. So we are, we're a dog family. Um, and then outside of that, to keep my sanity with working full time and uh, four kids and um, who are, who were all in sports at one time, um, I like to do running. I've ran like maybe 10 marathons or so, but, um, and my husband's a runner. We both kind of fight for who's going out for a run. Um, that's kind of how I had a, how I started running was, um, when our kids were little, we were both going, like, I'm going for a run. No, I'm going for a run. So then that's how I started. <laughs> wow. So what's your, what was your favorite marathon? So I would say, you know, that's a hard question. Um, cause they're all a little bit different, but I, Jop, I did Joplin, um, marathon and that's where, um, they, it's like a fundraiser for there's a F5 tornado that went through there. Mm -hmm. So the last um, mile has uh, banners up of everyone's names who uh, passed away. Um, so it was very emotional finish and, and marathons are emotional anyway, when you kind of run all that time mm -hmm. and you get to the end. Um, so seeing that and the the impact of that um, was pretty amazing. Hmm. Wow. It's actually we, uh, so, you know, I live in Kansas city. So Joplin, um, at the time I actually lived in St. Louis. Um, but the, when the Joplin tornado hit, but my wife and I and a group from our church went down and did a bunch of cleanup, um, after the, after, after the tornado hit. And that was, whew, that was just, I was just, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to describe, uh, the aftermath of such a, such a crazy, huge tornado. Um, but yeah, we tried to we tried to do as much as we could, but yeah, I can see why yeah. that would be a an emotional uh, end to the run. Yeah, and just the just the feelings and the um, just the people there in the community and mm -hmm. all of that was amazing too. Yeah, awesome. So, um, what? 
happened in your early career that led you to the assistant role? Yeah. So um, after I graduated, I had planned to go to college. Um, I actually, um, at graduation, um, when they put like the sash around you, I found out I was like top 10% of my class, which I had no idea. And I think it surprised my family when I walked out. It surprised me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I basically, I, um, and I guess the other thing that was surprising about that, um, well, in, in high school, like right before graduation, they announced like half the class wasn't going to pass unless they uh, got their grades up. So that's probably how I got into top 10% of my class. But um <laughs> So then I was planning to go to college um, and actually I played basketball. So I was thinking going to like a small um, college, wasn't going to get a scholarship or anything like that. But someone had talked, came to our school and talked about executive secretarial school and it was a trade school. And um, Hmm. so I was like, well, maybe I'll, you know, those skills would be great going into college. And so I could do that first and then go into college so I did that. And then um, they had a great placement program. It was like a, a year long program. And they put me into Morrison Knudsen Engineering. And so I started as an assistant there. And my mom was actually an executive assistant. And so I was like, she had a great career and loved it. So I was like, OK, I'm, I'm going to try this. Um, and I, in the back of my mind, I always thought, well, I can go back to college if I needed to do that. Um, and then when I was at Morrison Knudsen, I had a placement agency call me. And they were like, it was probably after two years I was there and they're like, hey, we've got this role that came up at the Boston Consulting Group. We found your resume that fell behind a filing cabinet, those filing cabinets back then. And uh, I was like, um, I said, no, I'm not interested. I love where I'm at. And they're like, it's three weeks vacation. It's higher pay. Um, So I saying, and I was like, "Um, okay, well, I think I can look at it. So I went and interviewed. um, So that's how it brought me to BCG. Um, when I was about 20 years old, and I have kind of grown up um, at BCG ever since. Wow, that's crazy. So uh, you there, there's not really a lot of trade schools for assistants anymore, really. I mean, there's there's some, you know, quote unquote, normal colleges that have, um, you know, admin tracks, but that's... Uh, it's actually pretty an, an an interesting thing because in my mind I'm like, it actually could be helpful to have some sort of onboarding process for that for our role um, to give us hands on experience. Like my wife worked in construction and she was on the track to be a superintendent and she wanted to be she wanted to get hands on experience on the job experience before she became a superintendent. So she basically demoted herself and became a, a carpenter apprentice and went into the field and, and learned the trade. And that's, that's kind of like, there's, there's not really a lot of opportunities to do that as an assistant other than just going and getting an assistant job and getting on the job 100%. training. And, so, and I do. Yeah. I, I think uh, I think there's so much value in that if if there was a trade school, like I would actually I think we need to promote more trade schools along with college, like even for my kids, as I think about them and um, and, you know, call it not everybody has to go to college. Um, but I'm very passionate about the admin profession and uh, and as I hire EAs, you know, I know a lot of companies um, are requiring a bachelor's degree. Um, some don't. Um, we say strongly encourage. I actually think, you know, hiring the right person with the right um, just capabilities and that they can learn and pick up. I would much rather train somebody coming in that has the right attitude um, that. Uh, can grow into the role. Um, I think it's it's such a job where some, someone can come in entry level and grow mm-hmm. their career into it. Yeah, totally agree. Awesome. Well, so let's let's jump in then to your current role, and you know, you manage a team. How how big is the team you manage, and how did you 
decide that you wanted to manage a team or did you decide, did they just throw it at you? you like, how did that progression go? I know a lot of assistants listening, uh, maybe aspire to lead a team of assistants at their company someday. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your story through that journey. Yeah. So I started supporting um, Jay Puckett when he was at a manager level. Um, and then he uh, kind of grew his career with BCG. So I stayed with him through that where he then became um, the OL office leader of Dallas. He then led our Texas office. And so I kind of grew with him. Um, so I love that side of it. I love the support role. Um, so I think it was great that I could actually learn the job. And he was great at teaching me too. He would share the whys behind everything and share the business aspect. And he would tell me like, he would share the impact of my decisions, which really had me think about, okay, I don't need to do that again, but here's the reason why. And this is the cause of that. And so that working with him and him, um, you know, just coaching me through my career really set me up for success to when the opportunity did come up. Um, and at BCG, it's, and I think this is in a lot of roles, you kind of, you have to do the role before they actually give you the role. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of stepped up um, as a leader within the team. Um, we had some, a lot of um, team changes and turnover and it was an opportune time to kind of get the team together and say, like, what do we want our brand to be with our MDPs and with our executive team? Like, what do we want our team to look like? And so um, so I got the team together and we kind of talked about that. And then we talked about like, OK, so what trainings do we need to put into place? What do we need to do to actually achieve this goal? And so then we started doing trainings. And, and so I kind of stepped up in that role and started doing it. Um, and then BCG recognized me for it and then gave me the title. And then I just it continued to grow after that. Um, but BCG has been a great place for me to say, hey, I see this opportunity. Can I go for it? Like we had um, a, an opportunity. I managed our Houston team at one, at one time. I managed about 40 people because I managed our Houston EA team as well. Um, but I saw wow. a need in there where they didn't have a leader. Their um, their manager had just left. And so I went to my manager and I knew I could help that team with different trainings and um, some different things. So I said, hey, you know, I would love this opportunity to go down there and help this team. And here are my ideas. And I laid out kind of the plan and um, and they were like, yeah, that'd be great. And so, <laughs> nice. uh, yeah. So what's the structure? Is it a dotted line uh, to you or is it a... You know, do do you actually supervise directly the, the assistants or how does it work? Yeah, so which I think is great structure at BCG is to where um, the admin team reports into me versus into their executives, um, because I think they've got an ally and an advocate and somebody who, who understands the the business side of it, but also the admin side of it. So I understand like what our struggles are on this side. So where if I get feedback from an MDP that says X, Y, and Z isn't happening, I have the background of why that may not be happening. And maybe there's something they can be doing on their end to kind of help facilitate us to be able to bring things to closure. Um, but I also have a couple of managers on my team um, that report to me that also um, manage um, some EAs on my team too. So we kind of split okay. up. Something. Great. And remind me again, how many total are on your team right now? Um, probably about like 25, 26. I, wow. It changes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. So what are the maybe... What's what's the career development plan for the team? And, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've been doing this for a couple of years. What's next for me? You know, what's what's the process for that? Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things because I do look at it as like team development and then individual developments. So like each year I've got a different team. Like we could have turned, especially with COVID, we had a lot of turnover a lot of um, 
changes within the team. So what I like to do is like January, we get the team together and we talk about like what is working well as a team and what are things that we need to improve on. And from that meeting, I think a lot of teams do that, but I think the difference is, is the action that you take after that meeting to make sure that's valuable input. And um, I think creating buy-in with the team and making sure the team feels like their voices are heard of like these issues are going on or we're doing really good here. And even if you have a voice, but like leadership decides to go into another direction, at least you have that voice and people are able to hear it and you're able to have that conversation. Um, so we really try to create that space where people feel like they can speak up um, and so we have that um, we have that in January, and then we kind of plan our trainings and our initiatives around that. So whatever comes out of that, depending on what capabilities our team has that the need at that time, um, we kind of focus our training plan for that year based on that input. Um, and then we also plan like our affiliation plan, like how much the team is wanting to do, um, and different things like that. So. That's one thing we do. I think individually, I do think there's a clear, at least at BCG, there's a clear path. And I think this is transferable across other organizations too. There's basically the entry level role. And I think for me, it's matching. We could have like a senior MVP that's utilizing their assistant as an entry level admin assistant. And so it's like knowing what the executives need and how they utilize, because you could also have an MDSP who's utilizing their, their assistant as a chief of staff. And so that's much different. And so knowing, um, so I think like if, if looking at development for the team is looking at like where they are in their career and how can I match them with somebody who's gonna give them that growth opportunity um, and set them up for success. So like if I have somebody who is an entry level, maybe they're two years at BCG. And so it's more like they're not entry level, but they're not chief of staff level yet. And they're they're learning the role. Um, I can't pair them with a senior MDP who's going to be looking for chief of staff because that's going to mm. set them up for failure for what they're expecting. So I want to make sure to match them with the person that they the MVP knows, hey, this person um, is a senior admin assistant. So that means they're great at uh, attention to detail, the, the task of the job, they've mastered that, but they're starting to learn the business. They're starting to learn how to be proactive. They're starting to work ahead. So then the MDP knows that they are, um, they know what level of support to expect. And so they're not going to expect that um, admin to be an EA to where the EA level would be. You're proactively working ahead. You're um, anticipating things that are going to come up and be able to work ahead of the MDP. So I think making that match and making sure that expectation is clear to their key stakeholder is important for their success. Love it. That sounds awesome. So what, how do you keep your team? So you've got this, these development plans, you, you try to match them up appropriately um, based on their skill set and their level. Um, what's We're, we're going to talk a little bit about finding happiness in the role. Like how do you keep your team happy? Um, but before we jump into that part, because that's related to this, this other question I want to ask, but um, what's your number one tip or maybe even logistically managing a team. So we'll talk about keeping them happy and how, you know, how do you keep your team happy? But logistically, like that's a lot of people. What's your number one tip? Yeah, um, processes. So I think um, especially with, that's the other thing we do at the first of the year, we kind of evaluate our processes and say what's working, what's not working. But with that large of a team, um, well, one is setting expectations. Like I think that's very important that everybody knows like what the expectations are of the role like um even like turnaround times so what is the team's expectation if you're sending something out and you're working with your peers like what is the the so making sure the whole team is aligned up here's our team's expectations and then here are our team's processes 
Um, and so like with backups, we have a very um, detailed backup process. Um, we've got uh, just working team norms um, of like, um, if you're working remotely or if you're, um, you know, on location or different things like that, and just mm -hmm. making sure those are everyone's on, it's very transparent. Um, and everybody's aware of that. Love it. Cool. Well, let's get to, uh, let's get into finding happiness in the role. Um, what is your process and strategy and vision for keeping your team happy? Yeah. And that, I mean, that's kind of how I measure our team success is um, asking that question. Like, is my team happy? If they're happy, that means they we've covered these five areas of things. I know everything's kind of running smoothly. So um, one thing uh, is every kind of discovering their purpose and understanding the why of why are they here in the role. And um, when I think about like, that for me, when I started, like work-life balance is really important to me at my home and um, just my career. And so when I think about that in the executive support role and supporting my MDP, like I want to make sure he's got a good balance of um, can he work out? Is he being successful in his career goals? Is he spending, is he there for his, his championship baseball game? Is he able to like I'm making an impact in somebody's life, but being able to balance all of these things and also being that voice of like, is this business meeting more important than your kid's championship game? You're not going to remember this meeting is not that important, but your kid's going to remember you're going to miss that game. Right. Um, so that was kind of my why is trying to make a difference in um, families, lives and, and, uh, and career and, and making an impact in um, uh, for BCG as well. But uh so I, I kind of, I have my team kind of think about too, like, what is their why? And like for some other people, it could be um, like some of my team members, like affiliation is really important, making people feel welcome. And um, so they're really good about like when we have people join new teams, like they're like making sure they have all of the information. And um, so like we have a lot of case teams um with uh, different projects that we have. And so when someone joins that team, they make sure they have all of the information and they feel included. And they make sure that manager knows like here are these milestones that we should celebrate for people and that drives them and makes them feel good. And so trying to figure out like, what are the things that you enjoy and drive you about the role? Um, and I think that's, and I talked about kind of my running earlier and we kind of talked about um, Joplin um, that marathon. And that was one of the marathons where I was trying to Boston qualify. And I, um, it was, um, I started the race and I had my friend there with me. And so that was my goal to, to, uh, qualify for Boston. Cause my husband was trying to qualify as well. And I didn't want him to get there and me not get there. Right. So it was, uh, um, so my friend and I, so my friend kind of held me back. So I didn't go out too fast. And it was a very hilly course. So I don't know if you know that about that, uh, but it was very hilly course. Um, and then, so I was going about like the the last two miles and I was on course and I didn't want to mess up my, P I was going to pee, well, I wasn't going to PR, but I was going to reach my Boston qualifying time. And so it's that last two miles. If I stopped, I was going to blow the whole thing up. But I was out there and I was like, why am I doing this to myself? why am I here? This is miserable. And so mm -hmm. those last two miles, I had to go back to that why of, you know, I am here because I don't want my husband to be running Boston and I'm not there. And I am here because of a tragedy that happened and we are here supporting these people that um, passed away. And then like going through like that last mile too, and seeing the, um, seeing the banners of the names and all of that and kind of pulling that why. And so I think about that when you think about your career and we all have ups and downs in our careers. And it's kind of when you're at that down, it's like, why am I here? And what is going to kind of pull you through um, to make you realize, okay, yes, I am here because this is important to me. And this, um, uh, this career is important to me. And um, I'm here to help 
you know, make a difference and an impact in this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that just, it, it kind of um, helps, helps people with motivation to be there. Right. right. Awesome. Yeah. Any other, any other tips on, on finding happiness uh, and keeping yeah. you happy? Yeah. I think that other thing, these, uh, I think maximizing people's capabilities um, as well as growing capabilities. So making sure like whatever their strengths are that we're maximizing those. And that's kind of like, well, I thrive off of chaos. I have like four kids and trying to juggle everything and so I was matched with an MDP um, who was also uh, thrived off of chaos. I think he studied for exams the night before and like he does everything last minute. And I actually love that. So like when we, he'd be like back in the day when we, you would print stuff, you know, we would be printing stuff and I was like, go down to your car, I'll run it down to you. And so I like, I'd love that. But there's other EAs I work with who hate that. Like they could not, like that would drive them crazy and it would be miserable um, and they're more of the planner. They like to plan like way two months ahead. And the MDP I was with, like, we were like, everything's going to change. Let's just wait. Um, so I would, I match people based on like where their preferences and strengths are with the MDPs that kind of align with that because you're, that creates happiness of, you know, you don't want to be in a place where you're, um, stressed out all the time or, or bored. Like I would be bored if I was matched with someone who was a planner and, um, wanted me to plan ahead, you know, two months out of a time. So yeah. trying to match that. Um, and then, um, also I think like growing your capabilities, if my team can look back, you know, uh, at review time every year, if they can look back and say, wow, look how much I've grown this past year. Look at the things that I've done. Um, that is really one of my goals for them too. And again, that goes back to making sure I'm pairing them with the right person who's going to allow them that growth, no matter where they are within their career. Um, and so I think those two things. And, and then I think the other piece is creating impact, like making sure people understand what that end result is that they're working with. So like um, in the consulting world, we have um, case team projects. And so really being able to be part of those teams and see the client work that we're working on and where their work is going and the impact to that, um, I think is very rewarding. And so I wanna make sure my teams have that as well. Um, and then I think the last piece is just feeling appreciated because I think that's just validation of what we do does matter. And um, the teams that we work with uh, show appreciation or executives. Um, there's some executives too that we feel like we're spinning our wheels. We're rescheduling, we're rebooking travel, we're doing things all day long. And and I, I know they don't know half of the things we do to make one small thing happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they just said thank you or showed some appreciation, like, and that's the piece I think when I supported an MVP is when Jay would say, wow, thanks for doing that. That was great. I was like, oh my gosh, that makes me feel really good. So I try to make sure our executives are showing, because I know they're so appreciative, but they just don't take some time to just to say it. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Well, Nikki, it sounds like you have a great, uh, great team and a great process in place and mission in place. Um, what's, what's maybe the, and I appreciate you sharing some of that, the inside scoop to how you lead that team, but what's maybe one thing you want to leave folks with today? Um, whether they're a part of a team or they're like me, where they're you know, maybe the only assistant at their company, um, what's one thing you want to say to the assistance of the world? So I, I would want people to know, like feel pride in our role and what we do and the impact that it does have. And I think the most valuable thing for an organization is the executive's time and energy. And that's what we do is we come in and we give them that. Um, and I think the value that creates and the impact that creates for the organization is, um, irreplaceable. So I think that, um, we want to make sure, I just want people to feel pride in what we do and know Mm -hmm. the value that it, it 
um, create. Well said. Perfect. Well, is that is it okay if people reach out to you on LinkedIn, if I share your link in the show notes and say hi? Yeah, I would love that. I awesome. love that. And I, I love to write LinkedIn articles. So I have a few of those out there on what we talked about today. And I just, um, I just posted another one about um, executive uh, tips of giving their EAs uh, feedback. So that's out there as well. Love it. Love it. Well, I will share your LinkedIn in the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 242, leaderassistant.com slash 242. For those listening, be sure to reach out and say hi to Nikki and check out her articles on LinkedIn as well. Nikki, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, Best of luck to you and your uh, team at home and your team at work. Uh, I'm one of four as uh, four, I have three siblings, one of four, however you say that. (laughs) Uh, Large family and um, we're all pretty fairly close in age too. So it's a, it's a fun time. So there's a team at home and a team at work. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, you're welcome. Please review on Apple podcasts. GoBullos.com